so to get started, I'm going to give sort of a history of metadata in, in the views of ex exploitation and defense and but motivate why we're interested in metadata and more specifically ELF metadata. And then to give you some background that you need to know to understand what we're doing. Um, this cobbler, this ELF metadata driven computation engine and of course conclude as talks usually do. So well, our contributions is basically we highlight metadata as something that's interesting. People haven't spent, people have looked at metadata, it's definitely interesting but we want to show that there's more to metadata than just something static. It, it really drives much, some, some dynamics and interesting environments. Uh, we built a Turing complete computation environment where the ELF metadata are the instructions and the runtime loader is the machine executing these instructions. And really we're just highlighting the loader's role in computation and trust. There's, there's something that's being almost ignored in what the loader does. It's really what sets up the executable for everything and we end up trusting that whatever is on disk will always look the same everywhere and perhaps that's not the best idea. So thinking about attacks, one of these things is not like the other. So think Trojans, viruses, any of this sort of injected code there. There's SQL injection, cross-site scripting, of course just these are all ex stupid examples. Not stupid examples, but they're examples. Stack smashing, return-oriented program. Um, so I like to think of these top views sort of a bring your own code attack. So everything that you add that, that takes advantage, whatever you give to make these attacks is always some code with respect to what it's being interpreted. And it's easy to see how a SQL injection eventually what, what it gets is SQL code. And cross-site scripting, you get JavaScript. Um, Return-oriented programming is interesting because this is bring your own data. You're building up these these well-formed stack frames and that's what's driving this weird computation, these weird machines. So, you know, code injection, bad. Um, and so a lot of focus and defense um, has been on code injection. So we have antivirus that scans for known bad code fragments and also does heuristics um, when uh, something is running. We have data execution prevention, so you, you can't write memory and execute it. Um, address space layout randomization. So if you have some code injected that's you know, calling addresses and dependent on that, if they're randomized, it makes it a little harder. Uh, code signing, so we kind of know or have an understanding of what is being executed is what was given or what was generated by the developer. And, and then input sanitation, which you know, buffer overflow is like one big vector of attacks for a long time. And so this is one good way of um, helping is input sanitation. So what about malicious data? So in this idea, we have data being the bytecode to this virtual machine. And the execution environment could be anything, but we consider that the virtual machine in this weird machine that we have going. And so ROP is a great example um, that a lot of people know. So we injected are these well-formed stack frames and then the processor just, you know, no, with the known calling conventions and so forth, executes these and we have this nice machine going. Um, and so a lot of defenses for, you know, code injection work here, but to different degrees. So ASLR is, you know, helps protect about return to libc and so forth. Um, code signing can help. Input sanity checking can help, but it's all kind of dependent on what, what data is really being fo attacked or how it's being attacked and what's the focus. So the role in data attacks has typically been very straightforward and, and it's like almost a means to the end. We overwrite pointers um, stacks in stack smashing, heap smashing, et cetera. Um, but it's not always that simple. So Locrate is a really interesting use of metadata for PE relocation data is actually being used as a binary in Packer. So what ends up, what is text on the actual uh, binary itself ends up looking different in the mapped into memory because these relocation entries will actually do computation on the text as it's loaded. Um, and there was an interesting attack um, presented at Recon last year on just taking advantage of this, in, this somewhat trusted metadata in PE to do code injection. And that was a lot more um, involved than just overriding these function pointers. 
So these ELF metadata-driven weird machines, um, most offenses, as I was saying, focuses on more code injection. And the interesting thing about ELF is it's what the loader uses to figure out how to set up an executable during runtime and also the libraries and so forth. So in a sense, these metadata already know what the address looks, space looks like. That's the point of them. Um, and when you start working with the metadata in an executable, the code is never changed. It, it, it's kind of cool. And, and, and yeah, metadata is just sort of more trusted in the code. It is what defines the address space layout. It, and it's definitely not normally a focus when people are looking at code injection. And, and then I've seen, and it's, we've discussed this a bit in the paper, that it's the Achilles heel of code signing at times, since there are some interesting trust assumptions on the metadata. And we're not the first to look at data as these instructions for, you know, turning complete machines. Um, and I'm afraid all the theory people in the room are like squirming about me using Turing complete. Um, but so stack frames for ROP. Um, so dwarf error handling metadata, which is also embedded in ELF, um, has been shown that it can drive Turing complete computation. Um, HTML and CSS3, this was a fun one. I mean, normally they're used for markup, but in, if they're crafted in an interesting way, we can actually use them as instructions as are C++ templates. Like, why, why code in C++ when you can just code in templates? I am, um, it, so loading, linking, and ELF. I'm mostly interested in loading and ELF, but everyone, like, you can't say the word loading without linking, and you're usually supposed to say linking and loading, which seems like the wrong order, but, so when you're executing some binary, say, exec is called on it, and so the kernel wakes up and says, oh, okay, I'm gonna load in the executable. And then it also looks at some metadata in there to figure out what interpreter should be used. And normally that's a dynamic linker, ld.so. In the, this is, of course, the Linux, Unix world. Um, and then the entry point for the interpreter is called and we're back in user land. And now it's the dynamic, I'm gonna, at this point I'm gonna call it the runtime loader, the RTLD. Um, and what it does is it goes through all the libraries that are needed by the executable and all their dependencies too, and load them to memory, reading through the ELF data to figure out where to put them. And libc is almost always loaded. I don't think it's possible not to load libc. And, and then finally, it calls the entry point to the executable itself. So it's a fairly simple process. And then finally, though, if you wanna do the linking, the dynamic linking, there's um, entry point into the loader linker that called DL fix up and that will be, it, it, and that will start uh, the, the loader, the linker to figure out where everything is and patch whatever memory needs to be patched and return code uh, execution back to the executable itself. So everything on the left is runtime loading and that's the real focus. So what is actually in an ELF executable? And, and I'm, this doesn't just apply to executable, this is also the library format and the object, the relocatable object format, but I'm interested in executables. Um, this is a summary, there's a lot of things I'm missing, but so section headers, they just say what the ELF contains. Segment headers basically is the expected memory map and permissions, um, where what on inside the file should be mapped where in memory. Um, there's a dynamic table which is pretty interesting. It's a summary of data in the ELF that is needed for runtime loading and linking. Um, and it's just sort of a speed thing, so you, the runtime loader doesn't have to like read through all the little structures, um, it's just a summary. Um, symbol metadata and relocation metadata. So symbols basically help mark imported and exported functions, objects, you know, anything that's global. And, and relocation metadata is just virtual addresses to patch and often they're used in conjunction with the symbol metadata. So like the symbols and the relocation metadata are just these virtual address patching instructions. There's some other stuff and then of course there is the program data itself which is you know, kind of important and the program code which is often no, known as text. So Cobbler which is our toolkit for taming the elf weird machine and this toolkit, it works on eglibc 2.13. Um, there's no reason it won't work on other versions, but that's, oh, and AMD64, so there's no reason it won't work on other versions, but this is what it works on. Um, 
And I'll also kind of go a little more into detail about that. So I'm going to be very nice, and this is a brain frick to Elf compiler. Um, if you don't know it, you can look it up. It's an esoteric Turing complete language, and it's eight instructions long, and it's just kind of a fun thing that people build strange compilers that go from brain frick to whatever else. And the idea is we want to actually compile some brain frick source into an elf um, such that if it finishes, the, if the BF finishes, then the executable will cleanly run. And so we can actually do that. And so this is sort of what happens when we are doing this compilation process. We use ERC to uh, parse an ELF, um, and then we use, uh, we wrote our own parser for BF and read in that source code. And then we wrote a compiler that actually figures out what symbols and what relocation metadata is needed. And that's actually added into um, all the structures that are there, and we use ERC again to write a new file. So we end up with some more relocation metadata added to the existing executable. Um, so the green in this photo, uh, in this image, are, marks like the original elf, hello. And the blue, it, there's actually some changes made to a couple of tables, and then new metadata appended to the bottom. And so, so that we need to change some of these tables so the loader knows that we have some other metadata, so you change a couple of pointers. But this is a basic idea of what you get in the end. And then where is this machine that we're using? What is actually executing these instructions? It's this, the loader, the runtime loader. So the runtime loader started, the entry point's there. So what happens? Um, well, the required libraries are then loaded. And there's these link map structures, which are actually important, that the loader uses to keep track of every library and the executable that's there in memory. And each link map structure knows where the base address is of you know, that particular block of you know, text code, et cetera. And it also knows where the relocation entries are and symbol metadata and so forth. And they're kept in this doubly linked list so that if you know where one of these particular structures are, you can look up all the information in every library that's loaded in this particular address space for this particular process. And so after it creates all of that, it just goes through every single um, link map structure, so representing the executable and all the libraries, and performs relocations for each and finally calls the entry point for the executable. So instead of actually showing you how to implement BrainFrick, um, we're going to just show a couple primitive instructions that you can build it off of to save time. So there's three I'll show, add, move, and jump if not zero. Um, and so in this particular sort of assembly language, the symbol metadata act as registers that are memory mapped and have metadata that are also memory mapped. Um, and then the bytecode is built from these relocation metadata. So there's a couple types of operands, um, immediate, where the relocation entry directly specifies a value. There's direct, where it's a pointer to whatever value needs to be written. Um, or there's register, where a symbol, um, it refers to a symbol, and the symbol, which is our register, contains the value. And then register indirect, where the register has a pointer. And all destinations are specified in direct mode, so all relocation entries specify the destination as an address right in there. So move immediate. Um, this is sort of how we're going to lay things out. The, the, the blue is the addresses in virtual memory. The black kind of represents memory. Um, the relocation entry is in green, and I'm just showing what the fields are, and I'll go... I'll try to tell you what everything means as we go along. And then the gray is just other regions in memory that we're you know, doing operations on. And this is going to just be an example, and that's how I'm going to show how move works. So in this particular example, we're just going to move the value 4 to the address B0000. Um, and so we use a relocation entry of type relative. And well, what does that mean? Um, it looks up the offset that's inside the relocation entry. And then looks at the addend and, oh, and then copies it over. And there's actually another type of move that acts like a mem copy, and I'm not going to go over that. That's in the paper. Um, and so addition, which will take two addends. Um, one is direct, and one is um, sorry. The destination is specified as a direct 
Um, one is uh, specified via register, and the other one is specified immediately in the instruction. So addition, we're going to add um, we're going to add value two to whatever is in the register called add, uh, and store it at beef zero 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 zero. Um, so there's a new thing here. The blue here is a symbol, and the fields are shown. Um, and this particular addition um, it uses a relocation entry. I'm calling this sim. It's actually not what it's called, but it's easier just to call it sim. And what it does is it looks at the symbol value, and it looks at the addend in the, uh, in the relocation entry, adds the two things together, and stores it in the offset as specified in the relocation metadata. And so one plus two is three, and it's written in the offset as the green relocation metadata specifies. Okay, jump if not zero. This is where things get a little more interesting. Add and move, nothing in add and move actually depended on what version of libc or whatnot. Like nothing depended on those. Those were actually depended on the primitives that were part of the types of relocation entries you can get and the types of the symbols you can get. And so those were the, those are the most portable. Um, jump if not zero is not as portable and this is why this becomes specific to this type of libc or eg libc 213. Um, so for jump is not zero we have a value that we want to test and a destination that we will jump to. Um, and this is not as simple. So you can't just say, hey, relocation, you know, machine, please don't process the next entry. It's just not designed to do that. So we have to look at how these relocation entries are processed. And this is a simplification pseudocode, and I've left a lot of out, but to give you an idea, um, this is what happens. Remember those link map structures I mentioned before, one for each library, it knows where they all live? Well, each link map structure also knows where the relocation entries are and symbols. So this is just a, it's, the relocation entries are processed all at once, um, one link map structure at a time, and it follows the linked list. Um, and, and, and then once it finds the next link map structure, it looks up where to start, where to finish, and calls relocate. So we need to actually do some preparation to be able to actually jump. Um, and to stop execution. So the first thing we need to do is put a loop into this linked list. So it will start, if once it starts processing relocation entries again, it will start within the same set of relocation entries. Otherwise, it's going to move on to the library that it loaded and process something else. So we need to set that to point to itself. And this is all mapped to memory, so we have access to it. Um, then we need to actually tell it what relocation entry to load next. So that is, we need to somehow set that address in memory to where to process next. And then we need to set the last relocation entry so it doesn't actually start processing crap because we actually want it to be able to exit cleanly and run the executable if that's what happens. Um, and then finally, this is the important thing, is we somehow need to set end to something less than where it started so that it will stop in its tracks and continue with the outer loop. So there's four basic things that need to be done. And all these addresses that we're writing to other places, we can look up. Um, we, we can figure out where they are at runtime, and that's all in the paper. But um, this is, it's basically four move instructions that will end up setting things up. And then finally, you set n to zero, and they'll break out of the loop. And you can end up jumping to somewhere, to another relocation entry and continuing. So con conditional branching, uses something kind of special. There are these symbols known as, um, of type ifunc, which stands for indirect function, and these special symbols will return, or function pointers, and whatever value they return is what ends up being written as the va patch value. So first, we should have relocation entries that do this bookkeeping um, to set up the little linked lists and what relocation entry the process next. And then we need to think about um, some code that returns zero. If we can do that, then there's some interesting feature with an ifunc. So normally it's treated as a symbol pointer, but there's a field in this symbol known as shindex, or that's what I call it. And if that's not zero, it will actually do call the indirect function. If it is zero, it will just copy that value. It won't call the function at all. Um, so if we move, 
If we do, um, if we move the test value to this particular field in the in the symbol table, or in the, the in the ifunc symbol, then we have this conditional behavior depending on whether or not the the field is zero. So just to diagram this out, um, we put our value to test in the shindex field, um, and we also know where this end is, so when it's processing these relocation entries. So this particular um, trick, we need to use just, um, again, a symbol of type sim, and the offset points to wherever end is. And then shindex, so if it's zero, the value will be just copied straight over, and we can do this such that um, the text is actually loaded after relocation entries, so we'll end up continue processing, and then you can actually have a relocation entry that sets up, that fixes the value of n so we don't overrun everything. And if it is zero, then, or I mean, sorry, if it's not zero, then this value will be treated as a function pointer. We found some gadget that returned zero beforehand, and, and then this gets set to zero, n gets set to zero, and we quit. And just a note about the ROP gadget, um, you can find something that's mapped at a fixed location because as long as the executable itself is not location independent, which most of them are not, you can find something inside the executable itself to return zero. And I've, I haven't had a problem finding that yet. Um, so there are challenges in preserving and restoring the existing metadata in whatever binary you're doing the injection. And a lot of this is, um, we talk about this in the paper and other things are in the code if there's not enough detail. And I'll point, I'll give the link to the code soon. And there are sanity checks um, in, the, in the engine that's processing these relocation entries that makes it a little harder, but there's workarounds. Um, the address of the loader itself and the data, all these link map structures, is randomized, but again, we can look that up um, from metadata that's at fixed locations that point into um, where structures in the loader. And end is actually stored on stack, but again, we're able to find this um, at runtime with relocation entries, and that's also in the code and the paper. So what else can ELF metadata do? So locate the stack, which is kind of cool, just from metadata, and it can maybe leak this information somewhere. Locate all the mapped libraries by finding one link map structure and traversing. It can redirect library calls, um, which is kind of cool. It starts playing with metadata that the loader, the linker, the dynamic linker uses, and just patch over there, and we can start redirecting these calls. And it also can perform function calls, although controlling arguments are a bit tricky, and I'm still thinking about how to actually do that. Um, so, so far, it's very fixed arguments when you do function calls. So, code injection can lead to bad things. Yeah, we agree. Um, and there's a lot of focus on this, but I think data can be just as powerful. We built this Turing complete relocation engine out of just ELF metadata, and ELF don't care about DEP, they don't care about runtime loading, or sorry, ASLR, um, and the loader implicitly trusts this ELF quite often. So we have this ELF, like the whole point of these metadata is for adaptability, so we can use this executable in multiple places. But we have this balance because we also want the metadata, we, it might be used elsewhere, so the, the developers, you know, they allow, the developers of like libc and the whole tool chain allow for such flexibility. I mean, that's why we have these indirect functions. But that gives you a lot of computing powder. So I, I want to know, is there a good balance in this particular realm? And I'd just like to thank um, the Trust Lab that I work with at Dartmouth and Sergey and Sean, and the reviewers, and um, Qualcomm, I'm currently interning there, and I didn't get to bring my cool cape because I don't have one. And then our sponsors, um, which was sponsored in part by the Department of Energy and Intel. So I'm here now to entertain your questions, and here's the link to the GitHub repo with um, all the tools, and um, yeah. We have a few minutes for questions. To what? How does this compare difficulty to the big redirection Right, so the question was how does this compare in difficulty to um, Sylvia's PLT redirection work? Well, so the, the PLT redirection I see is, is a very targeted, um, and I was working to generalize that. So we do, 
I believe, I, I hope we cited his work. Um, but there, it's, it's, it's definitely like an inspiration for this, all those metadata, interesting metadata pieces of work, yes. So, anything else? Going once. <laughs> Thank well, you. Oh? Uh, what I really like in this work re uh, is uh, the fact that you can generalize written oriented programming from code reuse to data reuse. So it has lots of implication in terms of um, intrusion detection, for example. People uh, can't detect code anymore on the wire. They start to try to detect addresses. Uh, now you're going to try to detect like relocation codes. And <laughs> it's like, it's a new paradigm for read-oriented programming. So thanks a lot, Gilev, again for Revika Shapiro. Thank you.